But doctor, that's the question. Why do I keep taking these pieces of junk off the side of the road, taking them home and compulsively making videos about them? I guess I do it because it's my job, but man, that's a really weird job. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Furniture Forensics, the series where I take fine-ish pieces of antique furniture and do a deep dive into their history so we can understand who made them and how they got to us. Today, we have a fine Edwardian daybed. And when I first got this piece, I understood everything about it. I knew who made it, who they made it for, when it was made, the style, everything. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized that my first impressions were almost totally wrong. And it was really different than I thought. And we're gonna get into all that, but wait, go back. We have a fine Edwardian daybed. What the heck is Edwardian? In the West, we name furniture styles after kings and queens. So Queen Victoria ruled England from 1837 to 1901. And at the end of the long Victorian era, people were looking for new ideas and fresh directions for fashion. When Victoria's son Edward took the throne, he was already a stylish leader. He had a taste for European clothes and furnishings. The Edwardian period was marked by an eclectic style, where different influences were mixed and older styles were revived. Where Victorian furniture had been highly decorated and very formal, Edwardian styles were more modern, with cleaner lines and less ornamentation. Most of us would still call this fancy antique furniture, but these designs reflected the public's desire to be free and open after the stuffy and restrictive Victorian age. These were the new styles, and they appealed to fashionable people. People with money. And this piece is clearly Edwardian. It's got that eclectic mix of styles. If we look at the legs, they look a lot like something out of the Queen Anne period, with those flowing curves. But if we check out the decorations, they look much older, much more like 17th century furniture. This is the eclectic mix of styles, a bunch of different things and older ideas combined together into a pleasing whole. And even the form itself, the daybed, that's very Edwardian. Just that idea that you could lay down in the middle of the day and flip through a magazine, that's the freedom and leisure of that era. Overall, everything we see here is just right for something that was made around here, around 1910. Now this piece is a lot rougher than the examples we just looked at. It's got a lot more tool marks and visible saw marks. And if you look at the decorations, they're pretty inconsistent in their spacing and their alignment. They were done really quickly. This piece is also made out of oak that's been stained to give it a slight reddish hue. And what they were probably trying to do here is mimic mahogany. Mahogany was the choice for stylish furniture for a long time but it was imported and very expensive. So using local wood and staining it to match that color, well, that was a great way to save a little bit of money. So I feel like I know mostly what's going on here. You've got a middle-class client who wanted new, stylish furniture, but couldn't quite afford those latest styles. So they go to a local country carpenter, somebody who can come close to that stylish furniture, but not get it exactly but he can do it at an affordable price. And this is a story we've seen over and over again in furniture forensics. And in this case, that story is mostly wrong. To really understand this piece, we've got to flip it over and look at the structure. And as soon as I start looking at that, things start to get surprising. The first thing is, there's almost no joinery in this piece. The legs are cut out in a notched shape, and these rails are laid into that notch and nailed on. That's a really surprising construction. If this was made by even a modestly skilled country carpenter, I would expect to see mortise and tenon joinery throughout. Even a moderately skilled carpenter would have been really familiar with that joint and would have used it a lot for its strength and durability. This nailed construction would have been pretty unusual, pretty second rate. The piece has held up for a long time, but the legs are a little wobbly. You can just grab them and move them, which is kind of surprising. And then a lot of the inside framing wood is actually, it's not oak, it's Douglas fir. That's a little bit surprising because you don't see softwoods used in this kind of furniture very much, but Doug fir was used a lot in this area. My house is framed with it. So that's not too weird, but seeing these details, it makes me want to look closer at the things I've already checked out. 
like those legs and their graceful curve. And the way they're shaped, I would expect to see tool marks from a turning saw and then chisels and scrapers for fairing out those curves. But I don't see any of those marks. The tool marks I do see look like they came from a bandsaw. And that right there is very confusing. It upends a lot of the things I thought I knew about this piece. Of course, I can't tell for sure. There's a heavy finish. It's not really clear. But I know if a bandsaw was used on this piece, there's one place I can look and find out for sure. Here at the end, we've got this curved piece, a nice graceful detail that sort of finishes off the end. Now, the outside of this piece is nicely molded and finished, but the inside has clear tool marks. They're closely spaced and perfectly parallel to each other. These are bandsaw marks, no question about it. And looking at this piece, it, there's another thing that really catches my eye. This piece is not made of oak. It's actually a piece of dug fir with a thick oak veneer on the outside. Now, veneered furniture is very common, but veneering is almost always reserved for super expensive woods, like walnut and mahogany. When you have pieces made out of common woods like oak, they're almost always solid. This is a very unusual construction, at least compared to what I'm used to looking at. As soon as I found this, I realized that the whole piece is actually made up of veneered softwood. The legs are solid oak, but everything else is dug fir with a thin coating of oak. These long side rails have that same veneered softwood construction, but it's even more interesting than that. There are really clear circular saw marks all along the underside of this rail. And at first, I didn't pay any attention to that. It's very common to see circular saw marks on wood that's straight from the mill. And a country carpenter would have just left those marks. Tool marks where the client couldn't see them were considered normal and acceptable. What's weird about these, though, is the circular saw marks continue from the softwood on the inside all the way across that oak veneer, which means the softwood was veneered with oak and then the whole thing was run through a circular saw, probably an early table saw. And that tells me that there's no way this operation was done in some tiny old fashioned joiner's shop, not in 1910. Solo operators just didn't have that kind of machinery. This was done in a bigger operation with big machines because that's pretty much all that existed. So was I completely wrong about this piece? It's not handmade at all. Is this, is this just factory furniture? Well, if it is, then it's tough to explain these decorations. This molding might have been made on a machine. I honestly can't tell. But all of these details down here were clearly done by hand. These vertical lines are really inconsistent in their spacing. Some of them are about two and three quarter inches apart, and some of them are over three inches apart. That means somebody was doing this by hand and moving fast. Some of these lines don't even extend all the way to the bottom of the rail. Some of the work's honestly kind of sloppy. Some of these small lines over here, they aren't even close to being perpendicular. They veer off at a pretty severe angle. These little gouge details here, these are nice and consistent, but they still show the variability of handwork. Now, on top of all of that, we have this highly decorated upper wing here. It's got a piece of thin burl veneer that's been inlaid into the wood and a really nice, simple detail that's been cut out with a carving gouge. We know this stuff was done by hand because in 1910, there were no machines that could do stuff like this. This is handwork for sure. So handmade or factory made? Well, it's actually a little bit of both. This piece sits right at the transition point between the entirely handmade furniture of the 18th and 19th century and the totally machine made mass produced furniture that we have today. Now, this piece wasn't made in a factory the way we think about it. It was more like a medium or a large shop, some place that was big enough to have big machinery, probably run off a line shaft system. And it was kind of an assembly line thing where you had different workers at different skill levels, each working on one piece of the same piece of furniture. So you would have had unskilled guys who were mostly just pushing pieces of wood through machinery. Then there would have been semi-skilled workers doing things like nailing together the frames. 
And finally, you would have had highly skilled workers, maybe even former cabinet makers, who were doing things like carving, decoration, finishing, and upholstery. And all together, they were making furniture like this at a very cheap price. And you can see that, you can see the cost cutting in the lack of joinery, in the inconsistent decoration, and also in the wood choices. The fact that they've taken a common softwood and veneered it with a common hardwood, that means they were cutting costs to the bone, doing everything they could to make a fashionable piece of furniture as affordable as possible. And that's what makes this piece still really interesting and exciting to me. It's got a lot of handwork in it, but there's a lot of history in here. I don't mind that some of it's machine made. I mean, this is the part where you'd probably expect me to go into some rant about factory furniture and how it's ruined the craft and blah, blah, blah. I actually don't feel that way at all. Yeah, I think most modern furniture sucks, but it's also cheap, which means it's affordable. One of my favorite books on furniture is called Irish Country Furniture, written by Claudia Kinmouth. And she's writing about rural Irish people in the 18th and 19th century. And one of the points Kinmouth makes is that there were families in Ireland in this time that were so poor that when they sat around the fire at night, they sat on rocks. These are working people who owned houses but didn't have enough money for the most basic furniture. So yeah, cheap furniture sucks, but sitting on the ground sucks worse. And on a completely different note, I just saw the woodworking video of the year. Richard McGuire's video from February on how to make a combination bench hook and shooting board is absolutely brilliant. And I know you're thinking he makes a shooting board, so what? Everybody on YouTube has a shooting board video. And that's true, but nobody has one quite like this. Richard has a basic stripped down design that you can make out of free materials in about an hour. And the project isn't even the point. What makes this video amazing is that he spends 45 minutes assembling this very simple piece with only three pieces of wood. And he goes into unbelievable detail about stock selection, wood movement, joinery, using your tools. He uses a very small kit of tools and he does the whole thing and even gives away free plans at the end. It is an amazing video, and I really don't care what anybody does for the rest of the year. This is the woodworking video of the year. Richard wins. I will link to that video down in the description. You should go watch it and subscribe to all of Richard's videos. He doesn't make a ton, but everyone he puts out is solid gold. Thank you to my patrons on Patreon who make these videos possible. It would be so difficult to make a video about weird old furniture like this if I had to try and sell you a website service or a table saw, that would just, that would ruin this content. And the only reason I don't have to do that is because of my patrons. Patreon.com slash Rex Kruger. Go and check out all the rewards we have for the people who make these videos possible. I'll see you next week. Thanks so much for watching.